Okay, so welcome back. And um, I'm going to continue on the theme of symmetries, uh, but on a in a very different setting this time, both from Amri's and uh, Nemani's talks. So the title of my talk is uh, Riemann Sphere and Mobius Transformations. How many of you have taken a course in complex analysis? A lot of you. OK. So it makes my job easier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so let, let's, uh, let's go back to the notion of um, symmetry, which um, you heard in the first talk in the morning. So um, So in the first talk, you saw what, ask the question, you take a square, and what are the symmetries of the square, right? So can anybody recall what one of the symmetry of the square is? Can, uh, yeah, uh, can you say? Yes, very good. So let's, let's do a rotation. Uh, sorry, one, four, three, two. So this is a rotation. So I'm going to think of it as a function. So this is a function from a square to a square. Which is invertible. So or let me say f has an inverse. Right? So that was one of the uh, uh, conditions for something to form a group, that any element has an inverse. So each of these functions, which go from a square to a square, they have an inverse. And if you have two such functions, they can be composed. So all these invertible functions, which take the square to itself, forms a group of symmetries of the square. That's what we learned in the morning. Right? Um, now what if I? Uh, so, so let me write this down. A symmetry of a square is an invertible function f going from a square to a square. So let me erase this. Now, what if what if I Consider this function. I have a square. I map it to a square. But what I do is I send this corner here, send two here. So this side, let me maybe use colors. So what I mean is this side gets mapped to that. 2 to 3 gets mapped to 2 to 3, and here is my 3, and so on. Put my 4 here. So this is and finally just let me use white. So this is a, a, a legitimate map from a square to a square. It's invertible. So uh, should we also include this in our group of symmetries? What do you think? The earlier one, that there is a discrete linear property against a string of continuous transformations. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you may include it if, like you just consider, say, you know, only the discretization. OK. So, so, so your answer is that we will get a bigger group this way. We can yes. earlier. This is a discrete group, and now if I allow all these kinds of things, I get a continuous group, right? Okay, but what is so special about that group? How do you uh, say that 
I guess discrete is a good word. So anybody else has an idea of how to kind of single out these particular um, um, isomorphisms of the square and not include those bad ones? Yes, yes, that, that's a good way to think about it. So um, what I can say is that the square has a certain structure. It has some vertices and some edges. And this map takes a vertex to a vertex and an edge to an edge. So it, if I say that the square comes with a structure of what are the vertices and what are the edges, those maps are preserving that structure. OK? So, so what happens is that in this map, the structure of corners, or maybe let me say vertices and edges are not preserved. So the moral of this discussion is that whenever we talk about a group of symmetries, we are talking about a group of uh, transformations which preserve a certain structure. So it's important to keep track of what that structure is. So symmetry is a map. Symmetry is a map that preserves a structure. Okay, and in the examples we do, we'll see what the structure is that we are interested in. Okay. So now we consider functions on the complex plane. And all the functions we are going to consider have inverses. So they are invertible. They are smooth. Their inverses are smooth. So they are particularly nice functions. If uh, you've studied some geometry, you would call them diffeomorphisms. Um, so let's consider some examples. So this should be OK for you, even if you have not studied complex num uh, analysis. If you, have ju if you just remember complex numbers from uh, whenever you have studied it, that, that should be enough to deal with this. So because I'm going to think of C as a plane where a point Z comes with an x and a y coordinate, and Z is x plus i, y. This is all good with everybody, right? OK, so now the first map I'm going to consider from C to C is translation by a complex number. So A is a complex number. And this is translation by A. So can you all picture in your head how it will transform the plane? So that's what we are going to do first. We are going to just write a list of examples and draw some pictures, and we'll work with those. OK, so, um, so what, what does this map do? So, so where does the point zero go? A, yes. So let's say our A is here, OK? Uh, and if I take a square, what is the square map to? Here, a square at A. And in particular, this side of the square, let's call it V1. This is V2. This is mapped to V1 here and V2 here. Right? So we see that uh, this function is literally a translation. So 
So any point is just translated by A. OK. Now the next example. Do you have any favorite example of these kinds of smooth functions on the complex plane? Anything? Um, OK, since what about something like 3 times z? How does this transform the plane? Huh? Expands. Expands. Uh, is anything fixed? Origin is fixed, yes. Uh, so a good way to think about this uh, are there any curves which are whose shapes are particularly nice which are circles. yes circles yes yeah so if you take a circle so here I'm using the polar form of Z right so if you have uh, not seen this before. This is so any point in the complex plane can be represented using uh, an R and a, uh, using polar coordinates, an R and a theta. Um, so what happens to the circle under this map? Yes. So the circle is mapped to a circle of three times the radius. And, and I want to consider a small area element, because those are what I'm going to be interested in sometime. So let's consider a small area element, which is going to be delta r in this direction and delta theta in that direction. So what is that guy mapped to? So a point, where is r theta taken to, firstly? r comma theta, where is it taken to? Very good. So this is 3 times theta, 3 times r. And what happens to this little square? Yeah, the area becomes 9 times. And what are the sides? How are they scaled? Yeah, so the, it transforms to a square like this, 3 times delta r and 3 times delta theta. So it becomes a square which is 9 times the area. Huh? 3R? OK, yes. Yes. That's, you're all paying attention. But is it still a square? It, it looks like it's not a square, right? It's not a square? OK, let's see what, what a, so if I say this subtends an angle of delta theta, what is the length of this arc? Very good, yes, r delta theta. And what is it mapped to? What is the length of this guy? 3r delta theta. So if indeed to start with this was a square, that would also be a square. Because the, both the sides will be scaled by a factor of 3. OK, and this kind of a map is called a dilation. Now, have you seen a map like this, where alpha is a real number? Yes, that's rotation. So rotation by an angle of alpha, yes. 
so I also want to point out uh, that not only are we taking squares to squares, we are also preserving the orientation. That's another thing to notice in these examples. So, and the same thing will be true here. If you think in polar coordinates, r to the ei theta is mapped to r to the ei theta plus alpha. So, a point at angle theta is mapped to a point theta plus alpha. And a square over here is just rotated. And it continues to be a square. So that's a rotation. Now what about this? Fz equals Cz, where C is a complex number. OK, someone who has not answered before, do you want to tell me the details? Huh, sorry, louder? Yes. So depending on the C, so how, how would you decide whether it's a contraction or a dilation? Yes. So basically, we need to look at the modulus. So, so let's we split up C as um, R E I alpha. So so this is just um, dilation by R and rotation by theta uh, by alpha. So it's just a combination of what we have already done. OK, that's easy. So since all these pr have this property that they take squares to squares, this guy also has the same property. Squares are mapped to squares. Now, um, what about um, This is example five. What does this map do? Reflection. Reflection, Reflection about? Yes. So uh, x plus iy is taken to x minus iy. So reflection about x-axis. And um, so, uh, so what, what happens to squares here? So let's just take a square here with a side v1 and v2. What, where is that mapped to? So suppose this is based at z0. What is the image of this map under the uh, complex conjugation? Yes, uh, so you reflect z0 to Z not conjugate. So you are just reflecting every point. So this is what the map does. So notice that a square is taken to a square, but the orientation is reversed, right? Like here, if you take your right hand and rotate V1 to V2, your thumb is pointing upward. Whereas here, you do the same. Your thumb is pointing uh, inward. So the orientation is reversed. So this is a slightly different function from all, all those things we've seen before. So, um, so we have to figure out like what do we want to ask out of our symmetries. Earlier we said, OK, maybe smooth in invertible functions who inverses are smooth. But uh, do we want to? restrict ourselves in some way. And uh, the, the, uh, the kind of structures I am going to talk about today, I don't want to allow these maps. So I do want to preserve something that's called a complex structure. 
And this is an example of a function that does not preserve complex structure because it reverses the orientation of my squares. So I'm going to consider maps which take squares to squares and preserves the orientation. So uh, huh. I think I'm okay. Uh, so, so, so let's dig, uh, dig deeper. Like, how do I specify such a thing? And uh, you know, we have been somewhat vague in drawing these squares and all. So we need to properly formalize what what is the structure that we are talking about? What is the complex structure? So that's what I'm do going to do in the next maybe ten minutes. I'm going to answer the question, what is a complex structure? And to answer this question, I'm going to use vector spaces. So I'm assuming everyone has seen some linear algebra. So, so I'm going to ask this question. Uh, so first I'm going to answer this question about what, are com what is a complex structure on a vector space by asking you the question, what is the difference between, between um, the two-dimensional real, ve real vector space and the one-dimensional complex vector space? What is the difference between these two? Okay, so that's... Huh? Sorry, say it again. Uh, yeah, I think we are going to be uh, working at a more elementary level. So if you've seen this before, I uh, let others answer. <laughs> Okay, so to un understand what a space is, it's good to understand what are its isomorphisms, right? Like we wanted to understand what is the structure on C. So what we started by just writing down a few maps and saying these are the maps which preserve the structure and these are the maps which don't preserve structure. So we are going to do something similar here. We are going to ask what are the isomorphisms on R2? So isomorphisms on R2 means R linear isomorphisms. Let's denote it by A, which goes from R2 to R2. Sure. OK. Let's look at R linear isomorphisms from R2 to R2. How do you think of these guys? Linear algebra. Huh? Matrices, yes, somebody said that. So you think of this as a matrix. Let's just work with an example. What about something like this? Right, this is a matrix. And let's draw a picture for this. So this is a vector. And this is another vector. So what does this? A10 is mapped to what? Am I right? And okay, so so a one zero is mapped to one comma one, and one one is mapped right. Uh, so let's call this v one and this is v two. This is a v one and a v two. And what is a square map to? A parallelogram, yes. So a square is mapped to a parallelogram. So linearity means that if you extend v1 and extend v2, this thing will get scaled by the same amount. But it does not say tell you anything about angles. On the other hand, let's 
Look at the opposite side of C. On, uh, so, uh, so these are the isomorphisms on R2. So what are the isomorphisms on C as a vector space that you would like to think of? How would you characterize these maps if you were to think of C as a complex vector space? Huh? Yes. Yes, yeah, you are, you are right. Um, but uh, what, what would you say if it, like if, I, if, if in, in, instead of C I had put in C square here, what is the word you would have used? Complex. Uh, complex linear, right? Like here we said R linear. Similarly, we want C linear here, okay? So C linear isomorphisms. And what you are saying is exactly right. It would amount to multiplying by a non-zero complex number. Okay. So if you consider C linear isomorphisms, what property, what, what does C linearity mean? What does, uh, what does linearity mean? Huh? Maybe someone who has seen this before? Correct. Right. So, uh, it's, uh, so uh, linearity of a map means it preserves scalar multiplication and um, addition. Right. In this case, the scalars, what are the scalars? Uh, complex numbers, yes. So there the scalars were real numbers. So you had, if V is a vector, so for any real number, you can pull out scalar multiplication out of this map. And here you can say the same thing about complex numbers. And this means a surprisingly stronger thing than what we have here because uh, suppose I tell you that this 1, 0 is mapped to some vector here, okay? This is A of um, 1, 0. Now, um, remember here you can put in any complex number. In particular, can I get this one by complex multiplying by some number? We can multiply by i, right? So in particular, we have a times iv is equal to i times av. So wherever this guy is mapped, 0, 1 is going to be mapped by i times of that, which is rotation by 90 degrees, OK? So that's like a huge constraint. Here I could just have mapped those two anywhere, whereas here I'm forced to preserve angle and also the lens because this, you, can, you are just allowed to rotate, okay? And not only that, why restrict myself to i? Why not multiply it by any angle? e to the i theta is a complex number, right? So I can just pull it out and do e to the i theta v, which means that here, Sorry. If I call this vector v, I can also say that this guy is going to make, a v is going to make an angle of theta with a of 1, 0. So, so uh, this uh, complex linear vector, uh, vector space isomorphism is, uh, not only does it take right angles or right angles, it takes any angle to the same angle. So A is angle preserving.
take squares to squares. Right? Um, any questions so far? So, um, if we, we started by asking what is complex structure, and the answer to that is C is, let me maybe answer the question where it was raised. Um, So the answer to this question is C is R2 with a complex uh, multiplication by I. So you can think of I as a rule which tells you how to rotate by 90 degrees. So if in R2 you are told this is how you rotate by 90 degrees, what you get is C. So that is the, so this is the complex structure on a real vector space. Any questions? Um, so, so far I have answered this question only on vector spaces. Recall that uh, if you just consider the complex plane, uh, zero is not a special point, right? And we are not consider restricting ourselves to linear maps or anything like that. So, so I will have to answer this question not just for vector spaces, but for a complex plane. And if someone has um, seen some advanced geometry, here I'm thinking of a manifold. Um, so, ha, ha, so these are, so here when I'm thinking of the complex plane C, zero is not a special point. And it doesn't come equipped with an addition rule and a scalar multiplication rule. So it's just C. So let's see what it, the complex structure means on that, that kind of a C, which is not a vector space, which is a manifold. So here, let me just tell you what it means is um, a complex structure which corresponds to uh, a rule to uh, rotate by 90 degree any vector based at any point Z0 in C. Okay, so earlier in a vector space situation, this guy only told you how to rotate vectors which were based at zero, right? So I had this vector, I said that, oh, this is V, this is IB. But now, my vectors are not just based at zero, my vectors can be based anywhere. Okay, so this is a Z naught. If I have a vector here, I tell you a rule of what this IB is. And I have drawn this picture nice enough that it do, looks like, like, like a 90 degree, but you can be a little crazy and define this rule in a smooth way in a more complicated way, but that will still be called a complex structure. So all this rule will have to satisfy, let's call this rule as a J rule. 
If you apply it twice, you should get a negative of that vector. That's the only rule it has to start satisfy. Um, and often, in the context of a manifold, I will use the word conformal. So, so and. Uh, and we are looking for maps from C to C which preserve the conformal structure. Um, and let me just define a, a smooth invertible map F from C to C is conformal, which is another way of saying it preserves the conformal structure. if uh, it preserves angles. So uh, all the first four examples that we saw, we, though all of those are angle preserving. And we are talking of, how, how did we talk of angle preserving? Um, let's go back to one of those examples. So let's, let's go back to the second example. So there we saw that uh, a point R theta. Is, is, is this too much to the corner? You can all see? OK. It's taken to 3R comma theta. And a vector here. If by rotating, uh, say if you rotate by alpha, you get another vector. And if I look at the images of these two vectors, let's call these v1 and v2, it will still be alpha. So we just verified it for 90 degrees, but with a little bit of work, you will see that it's true of any angles. And you may also be slightly mystified about how are these, how are we transforming these vectors? So if that is confusing, the way to think about it is you imagine a curve with this tangent vector, with the velocity vector, and apply the map, see where that goes to, and take the tangent vector there. So that is what I mean by how the vectors are transformed. So, and if the map is conformal, angles will be preserved. So if you have two intersecting curves and you apply the map, the angle between the image curves will be the same as the curves we, you started out with. And, and, and so also I stress why this kind of a definition is useful because this gives you a rule at every point. So we don't have to like transport it back to the original. So at this point, I have a rule. At this point, I have a rule. So if I map z to 3z, I just apply the rules at those two places and see if I have conformality. And uh, with this definition in hand, we can actually say that a remark um, um, sorry. The complex conjugation is not conformal because rotation by a positive 90 degree is mapped to rotation by negative 90 degree. So that is not conformal. And on the other hand, dilation, rotation, translation, all of these are conformal. So that's what we have seen so far. And the interesting result is that these are all the conformal maps on C. Uh, 
um, let me call this a theorem, a conformal map going from C to C is of the form AZ plus B. So AZ, as we saw, is a combination of um, dilation and rotation, right? Because A is a complex number, and B is translation. So any, any conformal map between C to C is of this form. So in some sense, this theorem tells you what is the symmetry group of the complex plane, or what is the group of conformal transformations of the complex plane. And um, so in the words of the previous talks, a conformal map is a symmetry of C. So, so now I can ask you a quick question. What is the dimension of the group of symmetries of C? So that uh, it, it, it's like an easy conclusion of this theorem. So uh, earlier, it, it's, it's a little bit of a leap because in Amri's talk, all the symmetries could be listed out. Okay, so there were, as you said, a discrete number of symmetries. Whereas here, you can vary A continuously. So A and B are complex numbers. And of course, for this to be a conformal map, A has to be non-zero. So A is a non-zero complex number, B is any complex number. So you can vary A and B continuously. So there is an infinite number of symmetries of C. But we, uh, yeah. What do I mean by what? What is the dimension of the group? If you were to put all these transformations in a space in a reasonable way, I'm not, uh, you know, if on that space, if you're varying smoothly, then your transformation changes smoothly. So the space of transformation has a nice structure. So what is, so there is, a, in, in this case, we are literally talking about two complex numbers. So it is literally an element in C square. So. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Degrees of freedom is a good word for this kind of thing. So what, so if you are looking at symmetries of C, what are the degree, how many degrees of freedom do you have? Uh, I, okay, uh, except that I count my dimension in reals. So since I would say that a complex number has two dimensions, so this has four dimensions, yes. So four real dimensions. Or two complex dimensions, whichever you prefer. Okay, that, that's, that's actually pretty impressive because if you just take R2 and allow smooth invertible maps, that's a, that's a huge group. It would be infinite dimensional. But you impose this condition of uh, conformality that cuts down the maps that you're allowed, and you just end up with a very manageable space. It, essentially, it is parameterized by these two um, constants. OK. Now, uh, any questions so far? Questions? Okay. Now we are going to move beyond the complex plane. And I'm going to, we are going to move 
to one of the words in the talk, which is Riemann sphere. And to step there, we, can, we start with an example. Fz maps to 1 over z. What's the domain of this function? Yes. You don't want z equals 0. So this is the range is also, the, uh, it can never hit 0. Um, so it's actually an invertible map between, uh, from c minus the origin to itself. And let's, let's understand the geometry of this map. So in any idea, like earlier we were drawing these pictures with circles and squares, uh, does anybody know what this map would look like, how it transforms the punctured complex plane? Someone who has seen this before in a class in complex analysis? Right circles to be R E part theta. Say it again, sorry. Right Z to be R E part theta. Uh-huh. And then that root from that to be one by R from minus R theta. So Yes. You're right. So uh, his suggestion is let's write Z in the polar form and then let's see what this map is. How does it act? So 1 by r, and what is the reciprocal of e to the i theta? Good. Exactly. So what's happening is, uh, let's draw a big picture here. So let's see what happens to this big circle of radius r. And let's say this is our circle of radius 1. So if your circle is outside of this unit circle, that means r is bigger than 1, then it's taken to 1 over r, which is less than 1. So, so if this is c, this is going to be f of c. And more, more, the point here, let's call this uh, Z0 is taken to F of Z0. And if you move in this direction, how do you move in the image? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, Im that picture pretty much summarizes what is going on. Because as your circles get larger, the images are going to get smaller. And conversely, uh, this map is its own inverse. As your circles get smaller, they are mapped to larger and larger circles. It, it does, is everybody very comfortable with this picture? OK. So uh, maybe let me write this down. What this does is F maps smaller and smaller circles to larger and larger circles. Okay, So as you get really close to 0, you are going to be mapped to a really large circle. So then if I were to tell you, be a little brave, let's try and extend this map to all of the complex plane. Where do you map 0 to? Yes, it looks like you are converging in on, as you converge in on 0, you are going to like larger and larger circles. So there is one point out there to which you can ma map 0 to. OK? So, and so, so when you add infinity to the complex plane, what you get is called the Riemann sphere. So let's, uh, we'll talk about that a little more. But this was the motivation, because the, the reason, uh, 
this is supposed to motivate you is that the uh, this is a map which is conformal. Okay, this is a conformal map. If you are not convinced, draw a picture because a square here is sent to a square there, and right. So the the inside is taken, the outside is taken to the inside, and the up is taken to down. So it is orientation preserving. So, but this is actually a good exercise. If you have not seen this before, work it out. Like, write down, like if this is uh, delta r and that is delta theta, what are these sides of the squares it is mapped to? So that's something you can work out. So that's an exercise. So this map is indeed conformal. So it preserves the conformal structure of the punctured complex plane. And what you are seeing is that the way the punctured complex plane looks near the origin is exactly same as how it looks way outside. So the, I can just say, let me add in a zero, and I'll add in one point outside. And every, we can do this while uh, getting a nice uh, complex structure on the resulting space, which is the Riemann sphere. OK, so let's, let's uh, start working on the Riemann sphere now. So the Riemann sphere is. Uh, is defined as just C union point at infinity. And let me, I don't know if this is standard notation, but I'm going to use bold S to denote the sphere. So, uh, well, it's a sphere, but how is it related to the plane? Okay, so the Riemann sphere is a sphere. You should think of it as a sphere living in three space, say a unit sphere. This is a Riemann sphere. And on the other side, we have a complex plane, which is a 2D object. And we have to now precisely have a map so that which respects conformal structure. So uh, as a quick remark, let me tell you that there is an obvious conformal structure on the Riemann sphere. And how you get that is you view the Riemann sphere as sitting in three space. And at any point, it has a tangent space. So and when you're looking at the tangent space from outside the sphere, you, there is a standard way of rotating by 90 degrees. So that gives you a conformal structure on the Riemann sphere. Now we want to make sure that we can, that is indeed the same, we can set up a map from C to this kind of a sphere which respects this these structure. And the way to do it is something called the stereographic projection, which we'll talk about now. Any, any questions so far? Stereographic projection. Just a minute, if there are questions, I'll get there. Let me draw my picture with the utmost concentration. So that's a sphere, and that's the equatorial plane. 
Uh, and did anybody have questions? OK, no questions. So I have to give you a map from the sphere to the plane, except that um, one of the points is going to map to infinity. Um, but let, let's get there in a second. And the way I'm going to define this map is uh, take the North Pole. And if you have any point P here, join P to the North Pole and extend the line to the equatorial plane. And it will hit the equatorial plane at a point, say P hat, right? So I just define this map as something that maps a point P to P hat. Okay. Is this map well defined on all of the sphere? So my, my the first step in the algorithm was if you ha given a point P, draw a line between the North Pole and P. So for any point, I can't do it except for one point. I, there is no unique line. And which is that point? Yes. So if P is the North Pole, then I don't know how to draw a line from North Pole to itself because there are so many choices. OK? So this map is only well defined from S minus North Pole. And If you throw in the North Pole, the way to do it is you just send the North Pole to infinity. So that is the map. Okay? And so let's let's get used to this map in the next few minutes. So uh, what is the South Pole map to? So this is the South Pole. Where is that map to? Huh? Origin, yes, because that north, north south is line will go through the origin, maps to the origin. Now let us take a latitude. So what is f of a latitude? So what kind of a circle? Huh? OK, uh, what's the center of the circle? Yes. Because you think of, if this is a latitude, you can think of these lines as uh, defining, uh, describing a cone with the vertex at the north pole. And this, it's an upright cone, so it will intersect the equatorial plane in a circle. So f of a latitude is circle centered at origin. Now, what about f of a longitude? So a longitude is something like this. Where is that map to? So what is the uh, it, South Pole is mapped to 0, North Pole is mapped to infinity. So it's a curve connecting 0 and infinity. And what is the curve? Huh? Line. Yes. So it's mapped to a ray. And the n is just going out to infinity. So, so f of a longitude is um, ray out of origin.
now, now, now let's try to do uh, ask another question, which where we try to invert this map. Um, so we know that if I have a line through the origin, okay. Uh, what about F inverse line through origin? You already know what the inverse, inverse image of a ray is. So what is the inverse image of a line through the origin? Full longitude, so full longitude circle. Full longitude circle. Now, what about any line, a line, not necessarily through the origin? Who knows what it is? If, uh, any idea, any guesses? Which longitude? Let, maybe let's draw a picture. Um, we are not interested in these things anymore. So let us so let's say our line like p, p hat is a totally arbitrary point. So let's just say we have a line through p hat. Okay, this is my line, and we want to see what is its inverse image on the sphere, right? So let's try to huh. Yes, I do know how to explain why that's the, indeed the case. Uh -huh. Yes, beyond is okay. The beyond point is going to be in the North Pole. You're right. But why is it a circle? Yes, I, I agree with that. That's what he also said. So I agree that here you have something which is going off to infinity and the inverse image is going to be something that is compact and you need, so it's something which meets up at infinity. So you get some a curve which closes up at the North Pole. But is, what kind of a curve is it going to be? So let's, let's, let's think about uh, how, how you take inverse image. How you take inverse image is on any point, if you have a point P on the line, you connect it to the North Pole, and the point of intersection with the sphere gives you the inverse image, right? Now, if you were to connect every single point of this line to the North Pole, what is the surface that describes all the lines? It's a, it's a plane, correct. So you can, so if you kind of join this line and the North Pole, you get a plane, and all the lines going from a point in this line to the North Pole are going to lie on that plane, okay? So now, does it help? Let me see if I can draw this plane. So if I just draw all the lines, it, it, they're all on a plane. And for each of those lines, the point at which it intersects the sphere is going to be the inverse image. So how do you get a full inverse image? Huh? Exactly. So, uh, so which can be done visually. You have a plane, you have a sphere, you look at the intersection, just geometrically. So what is the intersection of a plane and a sphere? Yes. So, uh, so let's let me attempt a drawing. So the intersection of this plane and the sphere is this pink circle. So what you initially guessed that it is going to be a circle is right, and the point at infinity on the line is 
just the north pole. So F, if, F inverse of a line is a circle through the north pole. And it is using this picture, it's not too hard to see that this map is conformal. So what does conformality mean? That if I have two lines here, and I look at the inverse images, the angle of intersection should be the same, right? So how, how, how do you, if I give you two circles on the uh, sphere, how, how are you even going to think about the angle of intersection of those circles? Like, if I have a, a circle, a circle, what is, how do you think of this angle? Yeah, you need to think of tangents. And we have defined our circles by as intersections with planes. So, so yeah, if two planes are intersecting, they intersect in a, yeah, it's, so it's going to be somewhat tricky because we are dealing with two planes and a sphere. But luckily, there is a nice uh, shortcut which I'm going to show you, which is that, um, let's see if I can draw a picture. So let me draw another line. And And suppose that line, the inverse image is uh, given by a blue circle, which will also pass through the North Pole. So this is the blue line. And that is the pink line, the original line. Okay, so I want to say that this angle over here is same as this angle. That's what I want to say. But there is something that comes to the rescue is that this angle is same as this angle. So, right, so I can calculate angles at the North Pole which simplifies my life because if I have two planes intersecting on the North Pole and have to find the angle of their intersections with the circle, the North Pole is just, the tangent plane at the North Pole is horizontal. So to find the angle, I can just cut up the whole picture using a horizontal slice and look at the angles, right? And and this plane is also horizontal. So the angle here and the angle there are going to be the same. Yeah, I think this is something you need to think about on your own. But maybe let me tell you the words. And uh, the, the key to do this is to, instead of focusing on the angle here, you focus on the angle at the North Pole. And when you try to calculate the angle, you find that you have two planes which are intersecting the sphere. And you are looking at the angle on the sphere. So instead of looking at the angle on the sphere, you look at the angle on the tangent plane on the sphere, which is a horizontal. So you have two planes, cut it using horizontal plane, and look at the angle. And here also you're doing the same thing. Those two planes are intersecting. You're cutting it with a horizontal plane and looking at the angle. So those angles are the same. So um, yeah, if you found this argument a little confusing, a reference for this is a book called um, Visual complex analysis. It's if you've done some complex analysis by a guy called Needham. If you have taken a course in uh, complex analysis, or if you have not, in either case, this is a fun book to read. So if you have some time in your holidays or whenever, and you like this kind of thing with. Uh, complex analysis with a geometric flavor. This is a great book to read. OK, so, so what we have shown is that the stereographic projection is conformal.
and that kind of uh, legitimizes my this thing that why did I suddenly go from a plane to a sphere? Like, uh, it, it didn't come out of nowhere because I'm able to construct a conformal map. So whatever complex structure I had in the plane can exactly be all transported to a sphere. And it has an infinity also nicely built in. So it's a reasonable object to look at. OK, so now what we are going to do is um, go back and we, had, we listed out a bunch of symmetries of C, right? Let's see what those symmetries do on the Riemann sphere. So what were our examples? Our first example, oh, I'm going to reorder the examples to make it simpler for you, was rotation. So if I rotate on the complex plane, what am I doing on the Riemann sphere? So note that all these maps, they extend to a map on the Riemann sphere by just sending infinity to infinity. So, so this is a map from Riemann sphere to Riemann sphere, which just sends infinity to infinity, and any other z to e to the i theta z. Or in, if you don't like the s, think of it as c union infinity. So all the conformal isomorphisms of the complex plane we considered earlier, they all extend to um, isomorphisms of the, sorry, conformal isomorphisms of the uh, Riemann sphere by just sending infinity to infinity. So, but let's draw the picture for those. So what does rotation do? So if I rotate the complex plane about the origin, the lines coming out of the origin, they all get, the theta line will be taken to theta plus alpha line. Right? So, and what were the lines out of the origin being mapped to on the Riemann sphere? Longitudes, right? Uh, yeah, so long, longitudes are taken to one another. So what is happening in the sphere? It's just rotation of the sphere on, along the north-south axis. So this is north-south. Rotate by um, alpha. Let me, um, so uh, let me maybe reiterate this point. On the complex plane, the picture is, if you are on any circle, you stay on the circle, but you go forward by alpha. And the circles, these circles are latitudes here. So another way to draw this picture is north pole, south pole, latitudes move along the latitudes forward by alpha. So move forward on latitude by alpha. So that is rotation. Okay, now what is dilation? So let's, I'll draw a convenient picture for you on the, so A is a real number, greater than one. So a convenient picture on the complex plane is, draw radially outward, oh, this is not a radially outward line. draw these radially outward lines. And if you're on one of these lines, you stay on the line, right? Because the circles are expanding. Your theta remains the same. 
So if you're on one of these lines, you just go forward by an amount A. So if you're at one, you go to A. If you're at two, you go to 2A. So you kind of scale yourself up, but staying on the same line. So by this, um, by, when I say by amount A, it's being a little imprecise, but you all understand what I mean, so I'm going to let it be. So let, let's transfer this picture to the Riemann sphere. So the origin is the south pole. And what are these rays coming out of the origin? Yes. So basically, if you're on a longitude, you stay on the same longitude. And you're going outward, meaning we are going in which direction? North. Yeah. So by an amount dictated by the number A. So go north by A. And if A were smaller than 1, it would have been what? Go south by A, yes. So, so this kind of a transformation is called an elliptic transformation. And that kind of a transformation is called a hyperbolic transformation. Because it's fundamentally a different picture, right? If you're looking at curves which are preserved under the transformation, those are the longitudes. And there, there are lat latitudes. So fundamentally, the shape of the transformation is different. Now let's draw more. So the third thing we considered was a combination of the dilation and rotation, right? Like if you multiply by a complex number. So that's literally going to be a combination of a elliptic and hyperbolic transformation, which is called the loxodromic transformation. But I'm not going to bother drawing it, because you're probably better at imagining it in your head than having it seen drawn. Because you rotate a little, and you flow north or south by whatever amount that is. So let's directly go to a translation. So what are the curves which are fixed by a translation? Like that's what we took the assistance of, right? Like these rays are preserved by the transformation. Are there any such curves which are preserved by translation? No, not a point. I want any curve which stays the same. Huh? Huh? I think someone said. Huh? Yes. The question is, here we saw that these concentric circles are just taken to themselves. So for the transformation, you just move on those concentric circles. Here we saw these radially outward lines. You move on the trans, uh, radially outward lines to define the map. Are there any such kind of curves, nice curves, for translation? Uh, let me write it down. OK, so translation is everything shifted in the same direction, right? So. What about these lines with A on them? That works, right? Parallel lines. So if you're on one of these parallel lines, since this parallel line has slope A, like slope, same as the argument of A, you stay on that line, right? So this is. So you go forward on one of these lines by an amount A. That's what this transformation is. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? OK. Um, so now let's transform this picture to the Riemann sphere. What are these lines? They are, so they are circles, right? Circles through the North Pole. This is the North Pole, and these are 
parallel lines. And it looked like it looks something like the dipole picture you may have seen in magnetism textbooks. So if you look on the other side, you will see, see a similar shape. And this is the direction of motion. So you go forward by an amount A along whichever curve you are on. So that's a, again a fundamentally different kind of uh, transformation. And it's called a parabolic transformation. And finally, we also, so far, all these have just been the uh, maps of C itself. We have not even, uh, infinity has been fixed in all of these. What is an example of a map where infinity is not fixed? Yes, 1 by z. Let's see if that's any different. So what is happening here? Here, uh, how, how does, what does this map look like on the Riemann sphere? The North Pole is taken to what? And what are each of these latitudes taken to? Right, so this is, uh, uh, say this is R, then 1 by R will be here. So as you go towards infinity, you will get circles which are latitudes which are going towards 0. Right, so in some sense, you are uh, inverting the z coordinate, but you are also doing one more thing. What is that? Angle, no? Because uh, theta is changed to minus theta. So, so that is flipping the y coordinate. If you think of this as x, y, and z, you are flipping the y coordinate and the z coordinate. So, x coordinate remains the same. So, this is uh, reflect about uh, I don't know if this is the right way to say it but it's like uh, you are reflecting about uh, an, a line not about a plane but about a line because you are flipping the signs of the y and z coordinates flip y and z signs and if you try to draw what this map does, it has two fixed points. What are the fixed points of this map? Correct, 1 and minus 1. And what it actually does is, it is actually just an elliptic thing. This is minus 1 and this is 1. So whatever picture you had, uh, whatever I erased here, which was rotating around the north-south pole, this one is just rotating at the minus one, one thing. So this is also an elliptic transformation. And it turns out these are all the transformations that we have. And let me just state my final theorem. Uh, the space of uh, any symmetry of the Riemann sphere is a composition of the above four maps and in general and the symmetry of the Riemann sphere it's called a Mobius transformation And if you want to write down the expression, expression of a Mobius transformation, it looks like this. It's what's called a fractional linear transformation. So you have four complex numbers there. So any Mobius transformation has that kind of an expression. And earlier for the uh, complex plane case, we saw that you just had two complex numbers floating around. But here, it looks like there are four, but actually it's just three. Because if you replace A, B, C, D by lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, and lambda D, you get the same transformation, because lambda and lambda will cancel out. So it is four 
complex numbers with the equivalence relation that uh, if they are scalar multiples, it's the same transformation. So then uh, the, the dimension of the space of symmetries of the Riemann sphere is how many dimensional? If somebody is really quick here. Six, right. So the, the symmetry group is six dimensional. And it actually is, if you were to write this down as a matrix, as a two by two matrix, the composition in the of functions is same as matrix multiplication. So this actually has the structure of a group of uh, these matrices, invertible matrices, modded out by the scalar multiplication, and that's called PSL2C, which is a Lie group. So yeah, so if you like these things, this was all too hurried. You can go read more about it. And the book I suggested is a great reference. So I, I'll stop here now.